Good afternoon, everyone. It's great to be here. I'm looking forward to today's discussion, Accelerating Innovation Through Clinical Trials, Patients, Regulators, and Research. This session of the 2024 National Health Research Forum will focus on a critical area of the research and development pipeline, clinical trials. I am so pleased to be joined by an exciting group of panelists for the discussion. Megana Chalasani joins us today from the FDA. Megana currently serves as the Associate Director for Clinical Trial Innovation in the Office of New Drugs in the FDA's Center for Drug Evaluation and Research. She's the Program Manager for the CEDAR Center for Clinical Trial Innovation and also co-leads the New Drugs Regulatory Programs Advisory Committee Workstream, a modernization effort to enhance CEDAR's advisory committees. Dr. Nikayla Cook is Executive Director at the Patient-Centered Outcomes Research Institute. She's a cardiologist and a health services researcher with a distinguished career, leading key scientific initiatives and in engaging patients, clinicians, and other healthcare stakeholders at one of the nation's largest public health research funders. Dr. Cook leads PCORI's research, dissemination, implementation, and engagement work as the organization enters its second decade. She provides strategic and day-to-day -day oversight of ongoing programs, as well as the new initiatives designed to create a more efficient, effective, and patient-centered healthcare system. And finally, we're joined by Julie Gerberding. Dr. Gerberding currently serves as CEO of the Foundation for the National Institutes of Health. Previously, she was Chief Patient Officer and Executive Vice President of Population Health and Sustainability at Merck, a former head of the CDC and world-renowned public health expert and biosecurity expert. Dr. Gerberding is committed to tackling some of the most challenging health priorities of our time and creating sustainable global health impact. Thank you so, so much for being here today. I want to start this conversation by talking about patient engagement. Dr. Cook, do you want to start us off from your perspective? How can we get more patients involved in clinical trials? Pleasure to be with all of you today. Um, you know, maximizing the involvement of patients as well as really other stakeholders and research is a central focus for PCORI. Um, and it's exemplified really in our mission even, which is um, about helping people make informed healthcare decisions and improve healthcare delivery by producing the evidence that is based on information from research, and this is the key part, that's guided by patients, caregivers, and the broader healthcare community. And we do this through the funding of um, patient-centered comparative clinical effectiveness research, or what many hear us talk about as CER, and that tries to compare those two or more interventions um, that already have some efficacy in terms of the way in which they're utilized to generate evidence that's gonna help patients and caregivers and others make impor important decisions for their healthcare. Now, we think about maximizing patient involvement in clinical trials through uh, many of the techniques and lessons that we've learned about engagement over the years. And to us at PCORI, engagement is really about um, making sure that patients and other stakeholders are brought together to represent the variety of perspectives that are really needed to make research useful to them. And it means that they have to be involved in every stage of the research process, from identifying the areas of focus through the dissemination and implementation of study results. So um, even planning studies and helping to design the research questions, they're involved in reviewing applications for funding and even in the conduct of studies, helping the research team think about how best to reach certain populations. Now, this type of meaningful patient engagement can actually change study design. It influences study design. It influences the types of outcomes of studies. And it influences the way in which studies are conducted in ways that um, really connect with those that were in intended and desired to benefit. I may pause there, but I'm happy to go on a little bit further as we get further into the panel discussion. Yeah, I do have a follow-up question about that, which is a, a bit, diving a bit deeper into the, the I know that PCORI calls it the science of engagement with um, with clinical trial uh, research. And how, like, so how exactly does that research translate into getting patients more involved in clinical trials? Yeah, so we know from many of the years that we focused on engagement and research that um, one is that engagement actually can build trust, but also trustworthiness of organizations and institutions in terms of um, building that trust that's necessary to then help facilitate the increased participation of certain types of populations in trials. And so that's one of the benefits and the lessons learned that we've had over the years. And we've learned as well that it can't just be taken lightly. It actually has to have uh, a meaningful approach. And so we've developed resources like the 
um, foundational expectations for partnerships in research that's built upon lessons that we've learned over the years and tries to really give a rubric for how to do this with core principles, including reimbursing um, patients for their expertise and the lived experience that they're sharing in order to really shape the research that's being conducted. We also recognized that the science of engagement is about taking the lessons learned from the engagement and the practice and then thinking about what's necessary to incorporate as we continue that effort to really make engagement more effective. And we've actually funded several studies that are kind of method studies to really understand the types of methods that work best in certain circumstances in order to engage populations in research. But also our foundational expectations expect that those that apply to PCORI for funding will actually do a rigorous evaluation in order to make sure that we're capturing what's working best in different circumstances. And just for the audience, I'll mention on our website, we also have a repository of many of these engagement tools that have been used in different research studies in order to allow them to be reused if potentially um, feasible or possible in other settings. I will have to check out that repository after the session. Uh, I, I want to shift our conversation a bit to talk about collaboration, uh, partnerships between research stakeholders and patients, uh, we know, is a mainstay of clinical trials. Dr. Gerberding. Uh, the foundation for NIH has long been a bridge connecting NIH to various partners throughout the research ecosystem. What are the key challenges and then on the flip side, opportunities for collaboration between NIH uh, and the R&D sectors of clinical trial research? I'm thinking especially of areas like vaccine development or precision medicine, rare diseases. Well, let me just start by saying I'm delighted to have a chance to participate in this important conversation. So thank you. Um, FNIH is really a bridge, a bridge between the NIH and patient organizations, private sector organizations, foundations, and philanthropists. We have a long tradition of building public-private patient partnerships. So I've learned a thing or two about herding the lions in those concepts. But I want to emphasize in the context of our topic today that FDA is also a really important uh, part of these partnerships, and of course, in a compliance appropriate way. For example, the Bespoke Gene Therapy Consortium right now consists of 38 organizations that have come together to try and develop not just gene therapy for a given set of rare diseases, but actually to try to build uh, standards, a sort of called playbook for what, are, what is the approach to good manufacturing practices for these vectors? And how do we go about um, solving the challenge of approval for, or, uh, for uh, drugs that can't be tested in a randomized clinical trial because the patient population is so small. So by coming together and working with the FDA, as well as small and large companies and a number of patient organizations, we've been able to implement or prepare to implement eight clinical trials of gene therapy. But more importantly, we've already published a playbook that hopefully will help all boats float higher. So as we get serious about developing cures for the 10,000 rare diseases that exist, at least significant proportion are gene therapy amenable diseases, we can actually not have to invent the wheel every time we begin a program, but rather we can have a platform approach. So I think one of the biggest innovations that is coming into focus for us in that space really is platform approaches to building vaccines or building gene therapies that simplify the regulatory challenges and hopefully also the drug approval challenges. Megan, I saw you nodding along there. Do you wanna jump in on uh, this topic of collaboration and where the FDA sort of fits in? Sure. Um, so we recently launched the CEDAR Center for Clinical Trial Innovation or C3TI. You know, of course we had another new acronym there. Um, and really one of the guiding principles was really around um, collaboration, um, right? The importance of that both internally, um, really bridging across the different types of innovative approaches and innovative programs that we have internally, along with the various efforts that are happening externally as well. Um, so I think like 
um, folks have said, uh, collaboration, I think, is really going to be critical for us to move the needle um, forward as we're, as we're driving clinical trials here for whether it's rare diseases or more common and chronic diseases as well. Absolutely. Another critical part of the conversation uh, around partnership and collaboration is getting more patients involved in clinical trials, uh, like a diverse uh, population of patients. Uh, to that point, the FDA recently released its long-awaited draft guidance for how drug and device companies should approach enrolling clinical trial participants to make those trials more diverse uh, and to get better quality data. Megana, for you, what aspects of that guidance should researchers and agencies focus on? So I'll start by saying that, you know, FDA has had a longstanding commitment to increasing diversity in clinical trials because we recognize the importance of having clinical research participants who represent the patients who will ultimately use those medical products, right? And so over the years, we've worked to increase the participation of underrepresented, underrepresented sorry, populations in clinical trials. And as you mentioned, Erin, in June of this year, June 2024, we issued that draft guidance on diversity action plans to improve the enrollment of participants from underrepresented populations in clinical studies. And so researchers, drug developers, regulators, and others will find this drag, draft guidance useful as we kind of, as a medical research ecosystem as a whole, aim to increase diversity in clinical trials. Um, for instance, the guidance describes the format and content of diversity action plans, the medical products and clinical studies that require such a plan, as well as the timing and process for submitting the plans to the FDA. Uh, according to the draft guidance, diversity action plans must specify the sponsor's rationale and goals for clinical study enrollment, and also describe how the sponsor intends to meet those goals. The guidance also urges sponsors and investigators to consider the many dimensions of clinical diversity, diversity so beyond age, ethnicity, sex, and race. And we, as an agency, as regulators, we hope to learn from the diversity action plans that are submitted by drug developers and share information and strategies as appropriate with the broader community. And so these strategies could include using translators to remove language barriers, employing technologies such as digital health technologies, or partnering with community leaders and healthcare providers. So kind of going back to that idea um, and the importance of collaboration. What kind of reaction have you gotten from stakeholders on the draft guidance? What has been the, yeah, what have, what have you heard? We've heard that it's uh, it's helpful. We're still continuing to receive feedback, but I think like you were saying, it was kind of a long awaited guidance. Folks were kind of looking for some direction, uh, some current uh, thinking from us. And so it's been, uh, it's been helpful is what we've heard, but we look forward to hearing uh, more feedback from the folks. Wonderful. Dr. Cook and Dr. Gerberding, uh, based on your experiences, what are the most successful strategies for encouraging and incorporating diversity standards into clinical trials? And Dr. Cook, I'd love to start with you. Great. I'm just going to check that my audio is a little bit better. Is everyone able to hear me? Okay. Um, so, you know, we expect at PCORI that um, the study populations really reflect the diversity of those um, affected by the condition of focus. And we really seek to fund research that is inclusive of diverse populations. And this is a broad definition of diverse populations respect, with respect to gender, age, race, ethnicity, geography, even clinical status, because we recognize that the outcomes that um, we're trying to reach need to be examined in defined subpopulations. And we even have standards um, uh, for our methodology approaches that applications must adhere to related to how they engage, how they examine things like the heterogeneity of treatment effects, how the interventions may affect um, populations differently. But much of this really is um, guided by uh, and reflected in some equity and inclusion principles that were established in partnership with our patient engagement and advisory panel because, you know, core in those principles are things like inclusion, which means not just a representation by numbers, but really intentionally creating a sense of belonging where every voice is really um, in perspective is recognized, valued, and respected in the research process. Um, equitable partnerships as another principle, which we think actually contributes to making um, populations and those that have not been traditionally included in the research enterprise actually feel that they're 
uh, equitable partners by defining and prioritizing the issues and identifying the research questions together with them um, and providing them agency and leadership in improving their health outcomes. And those inherent power imbalances that occur in the research enterprise when you're working with patients and communities have to be recognized and equalized in order to really bring um, that full set of en engagement efforts to fruition to the way in which trust and trustworthiness are built, which I talked about before, because they're present only when the team members can depend on a mutual reliance as they work together in achieving shared goals. And then the last principle is really around actionability and accountability. And that requires that our practices, processes, and people um, have to hold the research team to standards to embody the principles of equity and inclusion and those values to help steam teams really stay committed to them and their actions. And, you know, those principles around um, inclusion, equitable partnerships, trust and trustworthiness, and actionability and accountability are part of what underpin that framework I referenced earlier around engagement, which is the foundational expectations for partnerships in research. And what we've learned is when this is done effective, that's when you really can start to see the engagement of the populations that we're really um, desiring to reach, not just to study participants, but as meaningful partners in the research. I have a quick follow-up on that, on the, the inclusion piece. I, I can imagine that feeling included is maybe one of the hardest parts because it's not just uh, you know, a number on a piece of, of paper. What, how can you help patients feel, feel included? Well, one thing that we have recognized is that you know, there's a capacity building that has to occur in order for patients to feel that they fully can in, engage and feel included in research. And so we've created modules um, such as uh, research fundamentals to really help patients understand research and the research enterprise, to feel that they're, they're included in the work, that their perspectives are valued, et cetera. There's a, a way in which even building multi-stakeholder research teams that have researchers, patients, community members, and others working together is really important in terms of education about how to even communicate and create that level equal playing field. And so we've created modules around building multi-stakeholder um, research teams. And we recognize that building capacity is an important component, recognizing that um, things such as even how you communicate, when and how you're opening the door, and the way in which you carry through on what's discussed is important for that sense of inclusion and belonging. And often one of the things that we hear from um, researchers that have received funding from PCORI is that active listening is the most important tool that they have in their toolkit because often they need to ask the questions, actively listen, and make sure they follow up. And, um, and so those are some of the ways that I think inclusion really plays out in the day-to-day. -day. Thank you. Dr. Gerberding, I would love to hear your thoughts on this topic. Thank you. You know, um, FNIH has large platforms of collaborations, these private-public partnerships that I already mentioned, the bespoke gene therapy as an exemplar, but we have a number of them. One is a whole series over 10 years of, I think, 14 different partnerships that are looking at new targets and new pathways. Much of these um, look at specific diseases and specific therapeutic areas Kind of traditionally, a lot of really smart people, maybe those who know the most about where the problems are the biggest, we get together and figure we should do something about disease X. But we're backing the bus up, so to speak, and really beginning with communities of people and saying, in your community, what are the problems that you care the most about? Or if we're interested in a particular domain like mental health, then let's talk to people, not just the scientists or the, uh, the pharmaceutical company leaders, but let's talk to the people who are living in communities where these are problems and really make sure that end to end, we design all of our work with that patient centricity as our primary organizing principle. Now that's hard and it represents a change and we are not perfect yet. We have a lot of legacy programs that have been operating um, in certain ways, but increasingly we have people with lived experiences on the leadership of the governance of these partnerships. We have an all hands meeting every month and we always begin our FNIH all hands meeting with 
a person with lived experience who can really describe what it's like to have this problem or what it's like to care for someone with this problem so that we ground our whole organization, I would say in a cultural sense with why we get up and come to work every morning. So it doesn't seem so odd when we start measuring you know, where are we enrolling diverse people? Where are we including dis diverse people in these platform programs? But also who's governing these things? What kind of scientists, where is this work being done? So really have a very broad aperture to make sure that we are including the broadest possible representation from the people who we're hopefully trying to help by, at the end of the day when we do what we can do to help accelerate you know, drugs getting into the pipeline and, and out the other end at the FDA. But you know, it's almost a cultural dimension, not necessarily a set of activities or a strategy. And if you don't have the mindset, it's a lot harder to do the change process that helps you move the needle on the dial. Um, the other thing that I think is important, and um, Kayla mentioned that having advisory uh, councils. We have a patient ambassador group, which are a number of people with lived experience who are out living in communities and interacting with their um, stakeholders and networks to help them understand the importance of clinical research and the value in participating or advocating for it. But we also have an advisory council of people a mixture of people, some people who lead patient organizations and some people who are people with lived experience, but we utilize them. We just had a patient summit last week and it brought together a number of people focusing on women's health and you know inclusion and diversity in that domain. And then um, you know the challenge of the new medicines for obesity and what that means for people with the lived experience of overweight and obesity, but also, um, some of the challenges that um, coping with these new medicines really brings to folks. So I, I think it's a culture, it's a process, it's a constant learning experience. And at the end of the day, I think for at least my colleagues at FNIH, we feel like it's the most rewarding thing we do because it really brings full circle our science, but also our commitment to the things that really matter and the impact we, we hope to have. So we're huge champions, but we also have a lot to learn and do. So it's a work in progress. Yeah, I'm curious because you mentioned the new uh, weight management drugs, is there anything surprising that you, or just interesting that you've learned from talking with people who have lived experience with this, you know, uh, regarding this new product? Oh my goodness, yes. Um, you know, first of all, everyone is impressed with what the products can do. So let's, you know, stipulate that. Um, let's also talk about access because that's a huge challenge for many people. You know, if they have diabetes, they are generally able to get treatment, but when their A1C normalizes in some situations, they have to stop. So, you know, imagine if you had hypertension and said, oh, we'll treat you until your blood pressure is controlled. Then you have to call off your medications. We won't pay for it anymore. So uh, access challenges are, are very problematic for most people. Um, but I think the other part of the lived experience really has to do with coping with weight loss, um, coping with what happens when the noise in your head that tells you you need to eat, 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 suddenly gets quiet. One of our um, uh, thought leaders in this space described walking down the street and realizing how quiet his head was because he wasn't thinking about the Chinese restaurant and you know, wouldn't it be great to have a McDonald's? That whole um, intensity around food and food seeking is quench for most people who take these drugs. That means your pleasure center is quenched and that may end up having some unexpected consequences, positive or negative. So part of the conversation really is about the uncertainty. Um, how long can the benefits last? Are there other untoward consequences? Um, the most hopeful thing to me is, is, is the scientists who are saying, well, these are the 1.0 generation of this category of drugs and we're, we have more to come. There are like 80 different companies working on um, advanced 
uh, medicines in this space and that we may get to a point where we have more precision and we may have muscle sparing approaches and other um, medicines that accomplish the similar impact on metabolism, cardiovascular health, et cetera, but will potentially have a more tolerable and a more favorable risk profile. So more to come, but um, you know, it was a poignant set of conversations because on the one hand, you have this almost miraculous medicines. And then on the other hand, you have the complexity of the people who are trying to cope with their bariatric issues and the long haul. Some of these people have tried dozens of approaches to managing their obesity. And it's really psychologically hard to step up and do it again. Yeah, that's super interesting stuff. Um, I am going to switch gears a tiny bit. And uh, I want us to talk about what the clinical trial landscape might look like in the future. Megana, your role at CEDAR focuses on supporting innovative approaches to clinical trials that are designed to make drug development more efficient. Decentralized clinical trials have gained traction as a way to increase speed, reduce costs. How do you see the quality of data and patient engagement evolving using this model compared to more traditional models, more traditional trial models? Yeah, so fostering clinical trials with decentralized features or, you know, DCTs is an important way to accelerate drug development and regulatory decision making while leveraging um, new technologies. So DCTs often use digital health technologies or DHTs. And so these are the systems that capture healthcare information for the clinical trials directly from individuals. And they can collect data more frequently. For example, they schedule trial visits, um, sometimes even continuously. And so they're able to capture information during participants' routine activities day to day, and they provide insight into the effectiveness and the safety of treatment in real life, right? So it's really helpful, very insightful. And so incorporating DHTs, these type of trials can potentially produce data that's you know, quicker than traditional trials, allowing for the review and interpretation of findings to be quicker. Um, and, you know, I briefly referenced this earlier, um, you know, we see 3 ti FDA, we see decentralized trials and DHTs, these digital health technologies, as ways to increase diversity, right? Because they reduce barriers to participation. Perhaps people who physically or logistically cannot travel to a clinical trial research site, they have a chance to participate remotely, right? Or individuals with household or childcare responsibilities, they may find it difficult to meet those prescribed timeframes for clinical site visits. Individuals from racial and ethnic minority groups that may disproportionately live in areas without clinical research facilities. Decentralized trials really kind of opens up access to research for them. And so as technology improves, as data quality efforts increase, as we become more tech savvy, we're seeing the benefits of these programs as ways to engage patients and streamline clinical trials. That said, we should also keep in mind that some people may not be as familiar or as comfortable with new technologies, right? And that there may be other issues such as broadband access, which can lead to inadvertent exclusion of certain people. And so all of this should be evaluated for possible mitigation strategies before using any kind of new proposed technology. And so I think this kind of goes back to one of the key themes we're hearing from Dr. Cook and Dr. Gardenberg and so forth. And it's really that we have to include patients as advisors early, um, you know, whether it's a decentralized trials or as they're being planned or other innovative approaches that are being incorporated to really understand their concerns, their needs. What is daily life like for them? Um, and does it make sense? Is it fit for purpose to leverage perhaps a new tool or a new technology in order to collect information? Um, and so we really recognize the power and the potential of decentralized trials and digital health technologies. Um, and that's actually, I'm just going to put a quick plug in for one of our new programs, which is really kind of thinking around integrating randomized clinical trials into routine clinical practice, right? So really kind of 
bringing um, the research to where individuals are that can be research participants. Um, and I'm going to throw a link in the chat after, after my remarks here so folks can learn a little bit more about this program. But it's an opportunity to work with us, um, you know, for drug developers to work with us if they're thinking about designing a trial in this fashion, leveraging things such as decentralized components or digital health technologies or real world data, real world evidence or AI. Um, so kind of an, an opportunity to work with us to, to, to kind of uh, work work through that trial. Um, and I'll put a final uh, note in, it's actually hot off the presses. Just today, we issued our final guidance actually on conducting clinical trials with decentralized elements. Um, I think another long awaited guidance. Um, and so this provides recommendations for sponsors, investigators, and others regarding the implementation of decentralized elements in clinical trials. And so I'll share that link in the chat as well. And it's really part of our efforts to modernize clinical trial design and conduct to improve efficiency and really reduce the burden on participants and on those uh, conducting the trials. If well, I could just add a quick uh, a quick absolutely. connection with the FDA in, in this space as well as the NIH um, working very collaboratively with the FDA has just launched the Care for Health initiative, which is to support access to clinical trials in rural areas where the infrastructure for clinical trials is not necessarily well established, but that um, approach has is based on two principles. One is go to those areas and ask people what problems do they think clinical trials would help them solve. And the second principle, as Dr. Bertignale has said so clearly, um, be there for the long haul. Don't parachute in and do a trial and leave be there, invest, support, and really help bring the front line of clinical trials into federally qualified health centers or IHS hospitals, et cetera, to really get out there and meet people where they are to um, bring these innovations closer to the front line. Thank you. Some, some really good points there, and I'll encourage everyone to go to the links in the chat. Uh, Dr. Cook, I'm going to bring you in as well. Uh, how are you seeing innovative trial design play out in the work uh, that your organization does? Well, I so appreciate the comments that have come before. And, you know, I think some of what I was hearing is the importance of um, increasing speed, increasing reach, and also thinking about how we can get results in a, in a manner that's actually efficient for those that are participating and reduces the burden on them. And so I wanted to highlight one resource that we funded, um, which is called PCORnet. And it is a, um, a network and a national resource where high quality data, um, patient partnership, and research expertise is really brought together to try to deliver fast and trustworthy answers that will advance health outcomes. And this network includes um, over 13,000 sites and can reach more than 47 million patients in terms of the number of encounters experienced across the sites that are included in the network and is really targeted to address those issues of thinking about how to standardize and harmonize data that is important for things such as decentralized trials, but also in the type of manner that identifies a, a common data approach that allows um, data to reside in the health systems and centers where it's collected, but then allows for a way in which it can be commonly interpreted um, for national scale studies. And so this brings electronic health record data across these heterogeneous um, heterogeneous institutions together, um, as well as allows for pragmatic studies and trials to be conducted that can really reach broadly across the United States. And the other issues that I think are really interesting here is that it can help facilitate rapid recruitment for clinical trials, but also do trials a little bit differently. Um, and a couple of examples there, um, the NIH is actually funding the preventable study. That's a study that's being that's taken place utilizing the PCORnet network. And it's a randomized trial looking at whether statins can prevent dementia in about 20,000 adults over the age of 75. Now, it's building on some of the things that had been um, learned from prior clinical trials that were funded by PCORI using PCORnet. But this is the kind of thing that has online enrollment, consenting and randomization that's online, shipping study medications to participants' homes in order to have those elements that try to reduce the burden but still facilitate the trial. 
there are follow-up calls and home in-home visits and remote visits for cognitive and functional assessments. And so that ability to really get closer to where the clinical trial participant um, is and resides is um, what this is trying to do. So, you know, I think that we have this opportunity in, long ter in the long term, um, similar to what we've been talking about earlier, to really bring together clinical trials much more integrated into clinical care, where we can ask those questions that are of relevance to patients, leverage things like wearables and artificial intelligence and machine learning, and even the technology and health systems to allow us to um, collect and report on health outcomes in really virtuous cycles that can help accelerate um, the translation and impact that patients and clinicians and others can have as partners in research. So I'm hopeful for a day like that and think that it's on the horizon given all these innovations that we're talking about today. Thank you. It looks like we are just about at time, but I'd like to end with some closing thoughts uh, from each of our panelists. I've learned so much today already. Uh, but my question for each of you, what would you most like our audience to take away from today's discussion? Uh, Dr. Cook, I will throw it over to you first and then we can go around. I don't think this will be a surprise to anyone that I'll say that the importance of involving patients and others in the healthcare community at every stage of the research process is one of the most important takeaways I think I can um, provide. Remember from identifying the question of focus to the study design, even the outcomes most important to patients. Um, and that will facilitate the participation in the study and also help with the dissemination and uptake of results. So I think it's a critical component. Megan, I'd love to toss it to you next. Sure. I mean, when I think about the state of science and the state of clinical trials, I'll say that I think I'm optimistic. And I hope this conversation leaves the audience feeling optimistic mm -hmm. as well, right? So even as we're addressing new medical challenges, trying to, you know, find treatments for those 10,000 rare, known rare diseases that Julie referenced earlier, right? We really live in a time where innovation and clinical trials can really help drive success in producing data to kind of move forward, right? To support approvals of drugs and biologics and ultimately lead to more treatments uh, for individuals uh, living with, with diseases or conditions and improved outcomes. And this innovation, it's fueled in part by technological advances. Um, as Nikila mentioned, incorporating patient input early and often and throughout the design and conduct of trials, a deeper understanding of the molecular subtypes of diseases. We've just made so much progress in the state of the science right here. And then of course, kind of going back to where we started, right? A greater collaboration among the medical research ecosystem. So I'll leave us with that. Thank you. I love uh, I love some notes of optimism. <laughs> and Dr. Gerberding, uh, do you want to round us out? Yeah, I just agree with both of my colleagues, um, and I too am incredibly optimistic. Science is definitely on our side, uh, but we're bringing society along too. And as we learn to be inclusive, not just in counting up the number of X, Y, or Zs we have in our, our clinical trials, but we really truly respect and engage at the front line of where health actually gets created, which is at the community level, we can really begin to change the game on some of these chronic diseases. And I, I also uh, uh, agree with Megan that we will also be able to um, to build trust again in the value that all of this can bring to individual people and their families. We've got a heavy lift there, but I think this is the way to go to really bring the value of science to the people in direct ways that they can really understand and participate in a respectful and hopefully optimistic manner. So thank you. So I've learned a lot today. We've, we've talked about the importance of putting patients first, of truly including them in trials. Um, and I love how you, how you put it with science being on our side. Uh, thank you so, so much for being part of today's discussion. It has been such a pleasure speaking uh, with all of you. And thank you so much to our audience for joining us today. We are looking forward to our next session featuring Dr. Mandy Cohen, CDC director, and she will be joining us for special remarks in just a few moments. You can access Dr. Cohen's session in the lobby of the Zoom events platform. And thank you again to our panelists and to our audience. I hope you enjoy the rest of this year's National Health Research Forum. Thank you. Thank, thank you so you. much.